Good evening, I'm Judy Woodruff. On the News Hour tonight, one on one with John Kerry. The former Secretary of State reflects on America's role in the world and takes aim at President Trump. You have a President of the United States about whom everybody knows there is a disdain for facts. There is almost no truth coming out on a daily basis. Then an eye on sexual misconduct. The head of CBS is out after new reports of harassment and even assault. And Big Game, a new book goes inside the scandals and challenges lining up for professional football. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. Evacuations are gearing up tonight as Hurricane Florence turns into a major menace to the mid-Atlantic and southern U.S. It powered up today to a Category 4 out of 5, with winds of 140 miles an hour. The storm is on track to make landfall by Friday, and South Carolina has now ordered a million people off the state's coast. People in North Carolina and elsewhere stocked up on groceries and supplies today. Governor Roy Cooper warned against ignoring the danger. This storm is strong and it's getting stronger. The best safety plan is preparation and common sense. North Carolina is taking Hurricane Florence seriously and you should too. Get ready now. The storm could be the strongest to hit North Carolina since 1954. The states of Virginia and Maryland have also declared emergencies. The White House pressed again today for a federal investigation into who wrote that anonymous essay in the New York Times. The writer, said to be a senior administration official, claimed that top Trump appointees are working to thwart his worst impulses. Press Secretary Sarah Sanders defended the president's demands for the Justice Department to get involved. I'm not an attorney. It's the Department of Justice to deter make that determination, and we're asking them to look into it and make that determination, and they certainly uh, are fully capable of doing that. But someone actively trying to undermine the duly elected president and the entire executive branch of government, that seems quite problematic to me and something that they should take a look at. Meanwhile, President Trump called veteran journalist Bob Woodward a liar over allegations in his new book. It quotes Chief of Staff John Kelly and Defense Secretary James Mattis as disparaging the president. Both men denied making the comments. Woodward said Sunday they are not telling the truth. In northwest Syria, the United Nations reports more than 30,000 people have fled their homes as Russian and Syrian airstrikes intensify. The assault began last week in Idlib province. It is the opening phase of a campaign to recapture the country's last rebel stronghold. Taliban insurgents in northern Afghanistan kept up a wave of attacks today with multiple strikes at police and soldiers. They killed at least 52 people and seized weapons and military equipment. A provincial governor said nearly 40 Taliban fighters also died in the fighting. Sweden is facing political uncertainty after Sunday's elections. No party won a clear majority in parliament, but a far-right anti-immigration party captured nearly 18 percent support. The ruling center-left bloc lost ground, but its leader, the prime minister, dismissed the far-right group. Of course, I am disappointed by the fact that the party with Nazi roots could gain so much ground. They have no budget that will work, no improvements that will make life easier for people. The only thing they could offer is a widening gap in society and growing hatred. It could take weeks or months to form a new governing coalition. North Korea wound up its 70th anniversary celebrations today with thousands taking part. The festivities culminated in a nighttime rally in Pyongyang Central Square. Crowds of students carried torches, spelling out slogans. This year's anniversary promoted economic growth and kept long-range missiles out of sight. In Washington, the White House called the change a sign of good faith. 
Human rights groups in Russia say more than 1,000 protesters were detained nationwide on Sunday. From Moscow to the Russian Far East, riot police rounded up protesters and beat some with batons. The demonstrations were aimed at unpopular pension changes. Back in this country, the Miss America pageant has a new representative after a year that saw its leaders forced out over sexist comments. Miss New York, Nia Franklin, won the title last night in Atlantic City, New Jersey. There was no swimsuit competition for the first time in the pageant's 98 years. And on Wall Street, the Dow Jones Industrial Average lost 59 points to close at 25,857. The Nasdaq rose more than 21 points, and the S&P 500 added five. Still to come on the news hour, former Secretary of State John Kerry on foreign policy in the Trump presidency and his own new book. A wave of sexual misconduct allegations forces out the chairman of CBS. Why the U.S. is taking aim at the International Criminal Court, and much more. John Kerry has led many lives over a five-decade career in public service. He enlisted in the Navy in 1966 and served in Vietnam after graduating from Yale. A highly decorated officer, he then famously spoke out against that war upon his return. He would go on to serve in the U.S. Senate for nearly 30 years. In 2004, he was the Democratic nominee for president. And in January 2017, he completed four years as Secretary of State under President Obama. He recounts those years and those lives in a new autobiography, Every Day is Extra. And John Kerry joins me again. Welcome back to the News Hour. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. So this book is about your life, uh, your mm -hmm. public life, your personal life. I want to back into it, though, by looking at Washington right now. A lot of news about disarray, um, confusion inside the White House, questions about President Trump's leadership. In all your time in this city, have you ever seen anything like this? Never. And Never. is there anything you can compare it to? Well, obviously, the closest comparison is, uh, is uh, the years of Richard Nixon. Uh, Richard Nixon taped himself. Uh, Donald Trump had Amorosa, so there's a little more spice to it. But uh, what we're seeing, Judy, um, I regret to say, is simply not rising to the level of concern publicly or in choices that are being made by people in Washington who have an ability to have an impact. And I particularly think the United States Senate was designed for moments like this. That's why people have six-year terms. That's why it's operated under different rules. But one party appears to have decided that uh, their fealty, their, their loyalty to uh, party president and power is greater than their loyalty to upholding the Constitution and, and preserving the institution itself. I think it is stunning to me that I mean, look, you have a president of the United States uh, about whom everybody knows there is a disdain for facts. There is n almost no truth coming out on a daily basis. The major media have documented, you know, almost 5,000 lies now. You have a document being taken off the desk of the president so that a policy isn't put in place. What effect do you think it's having on the United States position in the world? Horrible effect. I mean, it's not what I think is happening. It's what I know is happening. There are certain people who are readily and happily taking advantage of this president. Uh, and uh, you've seen that, I think, with what China is doing right now in certain places. You see that with President Putin uh, in, in so many ways. I mean, what happened in Helsinki is a, is, a, is a total disgrace when he met with President Putin. And he came out of a meeting with President Putin and ratified, seemed to take President Putin's position on how we could get to the bottom of 
of the Russia investigation by having uh, Mike McFall, the former ambassador, be submitted, be subjected to coming over to Russia to have to be interrogated by the Russians. He gave up on the idea after 24 hours, but it shouldn't have lasted for 24 seconds. I mean, this is the kind of thing that uh, I, I think people all over the world are holding their breath and wondering what's next. Well, let me ask about some specific places, parts of American foreign policy, where we are watching problems right now, Syria. Uh, this is a place, it, it, been in the middle of a civil war, right now they are on the cusp of what appears to be a humanitarian disaster. The Syrian government, with the backing of Russia and Iran, about to go in and, uh, and attack the last holdout of rebels. Um, this over the, has happened, built up over a course of years, in which the U.S has not played uh, the role that many thought it had. You tried uh, in your time in the Obama administration to get the U.S. more involved. Is what we are seeing today honestly the fruits of the of decisions made during the Obama administration not to get more involved? It's the fruits of a long period of, uh, unfortunately, the entire international community failing to do what the international community should do. But I write in the book, there's a chapter on Syria called The Open Wound. Why? Because it is a festering open wound. Because we didn't, in my judgment, make uh, the moves we should have made to leverage Assad to the table. I thought there were things we could have done. Uh, the, the, you know, I lost that argument. Why do you think that <laughs> President Obama didn't go along with you? He had a perception and a different conclusion to his thinking process and his judgment was that it uh, carried risks that were not worth uh, taking, that it also would probably drag us in even more at a time when we were trying to get out of several other wars. I didn't carry the argument, the president's the decider, and, and I backed the decision. I mean, he makes those decisions. I want to move you through several other uh, elements of, of American foreign policy. North Korea. Um, you've been very critical of President Trump, but he did extend an outreach to Leader Kim, North Korea. Uh, they had a summit. There are some signs that the North Koreans may be slowing down. We don't know what more they are doing, uh, their nuclear well, the development program. Well, the intelligence haven't been any continuing. More. They, our intelligence community says they're continuing. So you don't believe but, there's been any positive no, move Judy, toward uh, uh, an agreement on nuclear, denuclearization? I believe that it is good to talk. I supported the president in his effort to try to reach out. But I don't support diplomacy that has not been thought through sufficiently to have a clear uh, preparation process for a summit and a clear understanding of what you can get out of that summit. But the truth is, there is no understanding on what denuclearization means. There is no understanding for how you move to actually account for the current weaponry they have. There has to be a declaration of what they have. Then there has to be an adequate process of access to determine whether that declaration is truthful and then how do you manage it. So you None of that has happened. So you don't see anything positive there? That's I see positive that they reached out and positive that they're willing to talk. I see it's positive that for at least this period of time, he's not firing a missile. But what we hear from our intel community is that they are continuing the production behind the scenes, quietly, under the table, right. and there are great indications that in fact uh, that, in fact, uh, Chairman Kim is playing rope-a-dope. Very quickly through some other points, because I, I want to get to the book, but I do want to ask you about the Iran nuclear deal. You've made it clear you think it was a mis huge mistake for the Trump administration to withdraw the U.S. from that nuclear deal. Um, what do you, do you think, just very quickly, do you think the Europeans can hold that together, A, and B, what do you think the Trump administration's goal here is? Do you think it's regime well, change? I do. I think that fundamentally they've, they're reaching for a regime change strategy. But I think that they have, in fact, uh, made a decision which is extraordinarily dangerous and, and counterproductive for our country. And so let me ask you a question. I mean, what countries are with us? I mean, a couple of countries in the Middle East 
who have always hated Iran, their focus is Iran. But the countries that are involved in the negotiation, China, Russia, Germany, France, Britain, are all supportive of the agreement today, trying to keep the agreement. And what's interesting is Iran is supportive of the agreement and trying to keep the agreement. Now, President Trump, by pulling out, has abandoned our allies, actually infuriated them. He has also broken apart the capacity of a moderate president of Iran, moderate by their standard. I'm not going to qualify it here. But to try to begin to move his country away from where they were heading and, and embrace change and an opening to the world. Now, the hardliners in Iran have been empowered by what has happened. And the president has made it harder for any Iranian leader to sit down and negotiate with an American. Because the hardliner said, don't negotiate with the Americans because you can't trust them. To the book. Uh, or more on the book and more on your life. How do you see your role in, in how the United States looks back on Vietnam? Well, I hope, I mean, John McCain and I defined that role to a degree together. And John and I didn't know each other well. He was the prisoner of war, spent five and a half years in jail. I was a protester who came back after the war I'd seen. So we went back to Vietnam. We created the, the, uh, an enormous process by which we account for those missing and dead or a prisoner. And, and, I, and I write in the book that one of the most profound moments of my public career was standing in the jail cell in Hanoi, in the Hanoi Hilton, where John McCain spent some of those years with him, just the two of us. And, and it, 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 it struck me if John McCain and John Kerry can come together and find common ground in a jail cell in Hanoi, we can solve any problem here in America. And that's what I want to ask you about, because you do write about your time in the Senate in the 1980s, the 90s, the 2000s, when even though there was clearly disagreement between Republicans and Democrats, they were able to work together on some important issues. Is this country ever going back to a time like this, or are we permanently changed. Depends on leaders. The rules of the Senate, I tell people, are only marginally. Tiny rule here or there, the nuclear piece obviously on judges. But basically the rules of the Senate are the same they were when it worked. It's the people who have changed. You've been talking uh, in talking about this book about the importance for Democrats of these midterms of showing up, voting. What is it that Democrats should be saying to the American people? Well, I think this, Democrats this are saying it to the American people. It gets swallowed up in daily tweets and in other things that are happening. But it's very, very clear. Only one party in this country made a point of, of nominating a candidate who didn't believe the president of the United States was born in America or was American. You know, only one party in this country has been willing to walk back uh, from their constitutional responsibility when you look at what's happening in the White House today. But the Democratic Party, I believe, wants to make sure that they're not going to take away health care from Americans because of, uh, because of uh, pre-existing conditions. I think the Democratic Party is very clear about climate change. We want to be the, 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 the people who bring the energy revolution that is millions of jobs, cleaner, saves lives, and makes America a leader in the world. You've referred several times to the need for presidential leadership. You haven't ruled out yourself running in 2020. I have not been thinking about doing it. My entire effort right now is focused on 2018 because in two months, we have an opportunity to make our democracy work. And, and it's a great course correction we could have. The difference in Donald Trump's presidency is not the people who voted for him, it's the people who didn't vote at all. But you haven't ruled it out, 2020. You keep going there, you guys, <laughs> stop. <laughs> Former Secretary of State John Kerry, and the book is Every Day is Extra. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. The chairman and chief executive of CBS, Leslie Moonves, is stepping down as several more women have come forward to accuse him of sexual harassment or assault. As Amna Nawaz reports, his departure marks a dramatic downfall for one of the television industry's most powerful men. 
The 68-year-old Moonves has been at CBS since 1995 and chairman and CEO since 2003. The accusations against him cover a 20-year span from the 1980s to the 2000s. Now, Moonves reportedly began negotiating the terms of his departure weeks ago after a New Yorker report earlier this summer featuring accusations made against him by six separate women. The New Yorker published a second report this weekend with six new allegations of misconduct or assault by Moonves. Within hours of the story's publication, the company announced his departure. The reporter behind both of those reports, Ronan Farrow, joins me now. Welcome back to the News Hour, Ronan. I want to begin by asking you about those dozen women across both reports. Give me a sense of what stood out to you about their stories and consistencies you saw across what they told you. Well, Amna, often in a body of reporting like this, there is a point at which you realize there are too many stories with too many similarities in the fact pattern for it to be coincidental. These were not women that were in touch with each other. There was no coordination. And yet they were producing uncannily similar details about alleged misbehavior by Les Moonves. The other overriding impression you come away with talking to these women is just how serious the misconduct was. I mean, we are talking about multiple allegations that would meet the Department of Justice's definition of rape, potentially. Um, multiple allegations of serious sexual assault, forced oral sex. And finally, there is a theme running through these stories of retaliation, women claiming that their careers were destroyed after they rejected Les Moonves. It's worth mentioning, of course, in response to your report late on Sunday, uh, Mr. Moonves released a statement. I want to read that in part. It says, quote, the untrue allegations from decades ago are now being made against me that are not consistent with who I am. I'm deeply saddened to be leaving the company. I wish nothing but the best for the organization. Uh, I want to ask you about the CBS response, though, not to this story, Ronan, but your first one. Back then, they said that there were no settlements or claims of misconduct that they knew about during Mr. Moonves's time. Time with them. In this report, you talk about a criminal complaint that was filed by one woman last year. Did the CBS board not know about that? We report in this latest article that a portion of the CBS board knew about that dating back to late January. So they did, in fact, know about that one. But tell me a little bit about the investigation now. Uh, there are two law firms that have been appointed to both conduct investigations. You've been talking to folks inside CBS. What do they make about how these investigations might turn out? You know, it's worth pointing out that these investigations are being led by reputable law firms and by two attorneys uh, at each firm. There's, there's a, a woman in charge of this that uh, I think commands respect. Um, that said, there are significant questions from these sources in the stories about the impartial nature of the investigation. Um, as long as the board was in place as it was a few days ago, uh, with a majority of its members very much uh, predisposed to be in favor of Mr. Moonves, uh, people within the company said, we are not prepared to speak to these investigators in a lot of cases, because they felt that there was no universe in which there would be an outcome uh, that actually held anyone to account, and they feared that they might be retaliated against for speaking. And that's partly because of the board, Omna, but it's also because this is not just Les Moonves they were complaining about. This is a broader culture and a story of men allegedly protecting them, each other within the company. That includes Jeff Fager, the former head of CBS News, who is still there. So there are women within CBS News saying they're still reluctant to speak to investigators because of that. So to that point, about that broader culture you reported on both times, do you get the sense that the investigation is looking into those possibilities into the broader culture? Do you think that there could be similar additional behavior uncovered? Uh, if these, this firm is, uh, the two firms are doing their jobs, then that's exactly what they're looking at. Uh, it has been stated publicly that um, they are looking at the problems at CBS News. Uh, we spoke to an executive in one of these stories who said that uh, the writ of these firms specifically includes the allegations against Fager as well as those against Moonves. There is some cautious optimism now, Amna, now that the board has changed, six members have been replaced, now that Moonves is out of power. Uh, but there are still a lot of questions for a lot of employees at CBS who are frightened to speak. Ronan Farrow reporting on this continuing, uh, and congratulations on your reports. Thanks, as always, for making the time. Thank you, Amna.
To learn more about what CBS's reaction has been and what lies ahead for the media giant, I'm joined by Meg James of the Los Angeles Times. Meg, welcome to the News Hour. I want to ask you about the timing of some of what we've seen from CBS. It wasn't really until the second report from Ronan that decisive action was taken. What's been happening in the CBS boardroom for the last several weeks since the allegations first surfaced? Well, the CBS boardroom has been very fraught over the last few weeks. Um, some of the board members were quite taken aback by the charges that Ronan's first article back in July exposed. I think a lot of the board members, um, some more older gentlemen, felt like these were going to be, you know, just um, casual uh, flings and that the, the allegations themselves went back decades. So they weren't really that concerned, or at least it didn't appear that they were that concerned until after the first story hit. And then a few days later, CBS said, like, yes, we're taking these um, allegations very seriously. And then a few days after that, they hired two very prominent law firms to investigate not only the charges against uh, Mr. Moonves, but the culture at CBS, CBS News, and, and all of CBS there was an SEC filing yesterday by CBS as part of another agreement I want to ask you about in a moment. But my reading of it is that unless the board ultimately decides, pending the investigation results, to fire Mr. Moonves for cause, he is now and will continue to work for them for up to a year in an advisory capacity. He also stands to get paid $120 million. Can you explain to us how that would work? Yes. Um, Mr. Moonves had renegotiated his contract more than a year ago, so there were provisions in place for him to be paid a pretty lucrative settlement when he left CBS. He's been in charge of the company for more than 12 years. He's been in, in incredibly many, successful, many one of the most later, successful executives in all of Hollywood. We, we can, and the board rewarded him with this very lucrative contract, which allowed a production deal and considerable stock and option and, and other compensation when he left. The board is now in a very uncomfortable position. They have a contract with Mr. Moonves that requires them to pay him out. They have not fired him yet, but they want to wait until after this investigation is completed, and then they'll decide what portion of that $120 million, if any, will be paid to Mr. Moonves. Now, the $20 million that is going to go to groups supporting Me Too and um, women's equality in the workplace, that money is going to come right out of whatever they would pay Mr. Moonves. It will likely be negotiated, I suspect, in the coming weeks when the findings are complete. And CBS can really look at the totality of the charges. So there's a lot of legal implications that come from um, the this review. And I think CBS in their filing um, early this morning or late last night just made that clear that they're going to put $120 million in a trust account and that, you know, will be sealed up until they can figure out how much, if any, um, Moonves is entitled to. Meg, there was another legal battle playing out in the background, uh, this one involving uh, their former parent company, Viacom, sort of a battle for control there. That was settled this weekend. Do we have any sense that the board's um, foot dragging in dealing with Mr. Moonves and these specific allegations. Was any of that wrapped up in the turmoil over that battle? Um, a little bit. I mean, it was separate from the sexual harassment charges. But um, last fall, um, Sherry Redstone, who is um, one of the controlling shareholders of CBS as well as Viacom, the other media company, started making uh, agitating for changes on the board. And I believe that um, Ms. Redstone felt like the CBS board needed a refresh. It needed new board members with different experience. And that's what was the compromise that they came to over the weekend, was that they would install six new board members in an attempt to assure the board would have independence, not only from Ms. Redstone, but also from CBS management. I think that there was a feeling that the, the previous board, the one that was just replaced, um, was a little too close to Moonves, and that was part of the, the um, rough and tumble um, between um, Sherry Redstone and Les Moonves, and he had had the support of the board, of course, until yesterday. Until yesterday, when everything changed there, a media giant has now forever changed. Meg James of the Los Angeles Times, thanks for your time. Thank you very much.
Today, Ambassador John Bolton gave his first official speech as President Trump's national security advisor. Bolton spoke to the Federalist Society, the conservative and libertarian organization, and he took aim at the International Criminal Court. But Bolton also targeted the Palestine Liberation Organization, and he announced the closure of the PLO's office in Washington. Our foreign affairs correspondent Nick Schifrin was in the room, and he joins us now. So, Nick, why are they closing the PLO office? The main reason that Ambassador Bolton and the State Department said today was Palestinians' use of the International Criminal Court, the ICC. The ICC is based in The Hague and is designed to tackle some of humanity's toughest challenges, war crimes, crimes against humanity. The Palestinians have said that they would go to the ICC uh, over Israeli settlements in the West Bank, over seizure of Israeli property, over what Palestinian officials call Israelis' use of force in inside of the West Bank. That's number one. Number two reason why the U.S. says that it's closing the PLO office here is that the Palestinians aren't being helpful when it comes to peace talks and peace efforts. Uh, Jason Greenblatt and Jared Kushner, the two advisors to President Trump who are creating a peace, peace plan, the Palestinians have refused to meet them since the U.S. moves the embassy uh, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem a few months ago. Uh, and they've also been disparaging some of the work that the two of them have done, even though that work isn't done. And so what you heard Bolton say today is that one, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, should not be investigating what, uh, what he called Israeli housing projects, not settlements, and two, that the, that the office here in Washington had blocked efforts toward peace. The Trump administration will not keep the office open when the Palestinians refuse to take steps to start direct and meaningful negotiations with Israel. The United States supports a direct and robust peace process and we will not allow the ICC or any other organization to constrain Israel's right to self-defense. I talked to Ambassador Hassan Zumlat, the ambassador to the U.S. for the Palestinians. He said, look, this is not going to change our behavior. We are going to take the Israelis to the ICC, and we're going to continue not to help Jared Kushner and Jason Greenblatt's peace effort. And he later released a statement saying, we stand firm in our decision not to cooperate in this ongoing campaign to liquidate our rights and cause. Our rights are not for sale. We will block any attempts at bullying and blackmailing us. So, Nick, this reveals not just frustration about what's going on right now, but long-standing frustrations with the Palestinians. Long-standing frustrations and real frustrations with the Trump administration over the last few months. One, the move of the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and President Trump saying, well, we took Jerusalem off the table. Palestinians, of course, want Jerusalem, uh, East Jerusalem, as a future capital. Number two, 200 million humanitarian aid being canceled by the U.S. administration that went to things like hospitals in East Jerusalem. Jerusalem that provided cancer treatment, for example. The Palestinian Authority can't provide that treatment, and those hospitals have lost that money. And number three, $300 million for UNRWA, the UN agency that helps Palestinian refugees, again, providing schools, health care, things that no one else in the West Bank or Gaza can provide. Now, U.S. and Israel say that those UNRWA schools, those UN schools, mm -hmm. were being used by Hamas to house rockets, and also that that organization was kind of uh, skewing the definition of a refugee. In the past, the U.S. has provided aid and separately hoped for a political solution. The Palestinians believe that this is the U.S. taking away aid to blackmail them and force them toward a political solution. So where does this negotiation stand? We haven't seen any peace plan, have we? We've not seen any peace plan. U.S. officials are hoping to release something by the end of the year, and, and they describe a different approach. Rather than a blueprint for talks, a negotiation between two sides, they really are going to release a robust, significant, long peace plan, and a lot of it has to do with economic incentives for the Palestinians, rather than necessarily than answering every Palestinian grievance. So you were saying that uh, Bolton spent most of his time talking about the International Criminal Court, the ICC. What is this, what's behind this? This is part of John Bolton's worldview. It, it really is. Uh, that states are the most important body in the international arena, and states should never give up any sovereignty, ever, especially to any kind of international organization. And the way to have influence in the world is not through allies, it's not through alliances, it's not through influence in multilateral institutions, but as he put it today, power. The hard men of history 
are not deterred by fantasies of international law, such as the ICC. Time and again, history has proven that the only deterrent to evil and atrocity is what Franklin Roosevelt once called the righteous might of the United States and its allies. That's pretty direct. So how does that play out in policy? It hasn't changed policy dramatically yet, but we are seeing Bolton's ideology play out across the administration's foreign policy priorities, uh, threatening the use of force against Syrian President Assad uh, and, its, and his ally Russia if there's another chemical weapons attack inside of Syria, threatening European countries, European allies, if they try and help Iran, basically calling their bluff, saying that they don't have the military, economic, or political weight to, to convince Iran to stay inside the nuclear deal. And in North Korea, North Korea needs to give up all of its nuclear weapons before the U.S. gives in very much. That is Bolton's philosophy. North Korea and, frankly, South Korean officials say that's not how it should work. We will take steps if you take steps. That's what the Koreans say. That's not a philosophy that John Bolton adheres to. Nick Schifrin, we thank you. Thank you. This week marks the last week of primary voting before the midterm elections. It comes on the heels of former President Obama making his presence felt on the campaign season. Lisa Desjardins is here for this week's Politics Monday. That's right. The early rounds are ending. It's a good time to get ready for the finals of this key midterm year. And, of course, a very good time for Politics Monday. Here to bring us up to speed, Shauna Thomas, D.C. Bureau Chief of Vice News, and Amy Walter of the Cook Political Report. Thank you. Let's just jump right into where we are. We have New York gubernatorial primary on Tuesday, on Thursday. We've got tomorrow Delaware and New Hampshire, which is strangely the last primary in the nation, I guess they could say now. Um, but let's go big. Why not? Amy, tell us what are the themes and what are the expected real battle lines for November right now? Um, I think the one theme that has been apparent throughout all of these primaries and all different kinds of states and all different kinds of districts is the number of women who were successful as candidates on the Democratic side. Um, my colleague looked into all the races for the House, and what he found is of all the candidates in Democratic primaries, these are without incumbents, okay, so open seats, a, de a woman who was running against at least one other man won 69% of the time. So women were winning a disproportionate number on the Democratic side. The number on the Republican side, much, much, much lower. But that is one key variable. And I think that's going to be, obviously, a very big talking point on election night to see if we do hit and exceed the mark set in 1992, which was the first year of the woman when a record number of women were elected to Congress. Shana, what do you see here? What are the two battle lines here? What are the two parties trying to sell? And where, where do they conflict in November? Well, I mean, I think the key battle line and the other big theme other than women, and maybe because of women, is President Trump. Mm -hmm. And there's no way to get around that. As many midterms are, they usually are about the person who who is in the White House. This one is no different, and this one is even more powerfully so about the person in the White House. And I think we saw examples of that, and I'm sure we'll get to this, with President Obama, former President Obama, being on the campaign trail will, in, yes. in Illinois, railing directly against President Trump, but also in California, striking a slightly different tone in California, but still making sure people know this is about flipping the House of Representatives for Democrats. And flipping the House of Representatives is, a, in some ways, a code of saying a way to put a check on the president. And the other main storyline, too, for, for these elections is just the difference in the maps for the House and for the Senate. The battle for the Senate runs through red rural states that President Trump is still relatively popular, in some cases still very popular in. The battle for the House runs through purple suburban America, where the president is not very popular. So we could have an election night where Democrats actually do very well in the House, but struggle in the Senate. Well, it's interesting. So if this is in part a test, at least in some places, of President Trump, but we have former President Obama out there, let's look at, first of all, let's listen to what he's been saying. This is from this weekend. Let's play the tape. We have the chance to flip the House of Representatives and make sure the real checks and balances in Washington. And I cannot tell you, all across the country, you can feel the energy. You can feel people saying, oh, enough is enough. We're going to kick off our bedroom slippers. We're putting on our marching shoes. We are going to go out 
and we're going to start taking some clipboards out. And we're going to start knocking on some doors. And we're going to start making some calls. We're going to volunteer. Kicking off the bedroom slippers, making some calls. <laughs> Whatever people do, Shauna, my question to you is, what does President Obama do for Democrats? What might he do for Republicans? Well, I mean, just like President Trump, President Obama comes with his, his flaws and his positives. The positives are, when it's all said and done, the person who is the head of the Democratic Party still, despite the fact that he's not in the White House, is President Obama. Nobody who I ever talked to has had a better answer for the question of who is the head of the party. Mm -hmm. One of the things our correspondent on Vice News Tonight saw um, when he was out there in California was that people were driving miles and miles and hours and hours to be part of this event. And those were hardcore Democrats. That wasn't necessarily an independents and other people, hardcore Democrats, but they're coming to see him. He is able to get that kind of rally and energy that President Trump, to a certain extent, can get on the other side. Um, so that's a positive. Great. The other thing is, in some ways, he is also the example of what people were rallying against when they voted for President Trump. And so they will. And so there are Republicans who will say, look, they're going back to Barack Obama. That is somebody you didn't like when he was in the White House. That is still the head of their party. Come out and vote for vote for the people who support President Trump. Amy is President Obama the head of the Democratic Party? Yeah, though I, I probably you probably remember this. I remember those speeches that he made, saying those exact same things. You guys need to come out and vote. You need to yeah. do this yeah. for my legacy. Whatever you do, st apathy is our biggest problem. He said that in 2010. He said that in 2014. He said that in 2016. Those voters still did not turn out for Democrats. They turned out for him, but never his party. I still believe that the biggest motivator for Democrats is Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And he is still the biggest, he's the 800 pound gorilla, he is the biggest factor in 2018. I do think, yes, Republicans are gonna try to use Obama, but mostly use Nancy Pelosi as the bogey person, right, to say if you elect Democrats, they're just gonna follow the same liberal marching orders from their leaders. But I think the bigger risk right now for Republicans is that Trump is taking all the oxygen and all of the focus that they would rather be spending talking about the economy, deregulation, and anything else that they're doing in Washington. They don't want Donald Trump to be making it all about him. Quickly, I wanted to talk about the U.S. Senate and something that might be going on in Texas, home state of yours, Shauna. I want yes. to show some video of Beto O'Rourke, the El Paso congressman. He's lighting a fire for many progressives. He's doing things like skateboarding in parking lots. It's <laughs> unconventional. This is something that the liberal left is loving, something that some people think might be a problem for Ted Cruz. There's a Marist Post poll showing he's within four points. What's going on in Texas? Does this man actually have a chance of becoming a Democratic senator from Texas? Well, I have to admit, I saw the Marist poll and also was like, uh, oh, OK, OK. So maybe he has a chance. Um, there is a possibility as a chance uh, in uh, the reporting Vice News has done when it comes to Beto. Um, he has gone to a lot of parts of the state that usually Democrats have ignored. He has made it his duty to go to every single county with the idea of like, if you know you can win Houston, Dallas, Austin, major cities, if you can pick up an extra thousand votes here way out west, if you can pick up a thousand votes somewhere else, perhaps this is something that 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 is actually possible. I'm still saying perhaps because I still think Texas is a still a solidly red state. OK, but okay. I think the bigger challenge for that's right. I think the bigger challenge right now for Republicans and holding a seat is Tennessee, a mm -hmm. deep red state where the candidate on the Democratic side is actually a little bit ahead of the Republican. But the Senate's getting interesting. Yes, Thank absolutely. you, Amy Walter, Shauna Thomas. Wonderful having you here for Politics Monday. Of course. A long-running feud between President Trump and the National Football League over players taking a knee for the national anthem bubbled up yesterday, even before players took to the field for the first games of the regular season. Mr. Trump tweeted, if the players stood for our flag and anthem, and it is all shown on broadcast, maybe ratings could come back. William Brangham explores the months-long dispute. By some measures, the NFL is in great shape. Football games are consistently the most popular events on TV, and owners are making millions. But the NFL is also wrestling with multiple scandals, horrible violence committed off the field by players, 
the growing awareness that players' bodies and brains can be irreparably damaged by the game, and of course the political protests by some players which have been amplified and attacked by President Trump. New York Times political reporter Mark Leibovich spent four years in and amongst the owners and players of pro football, and he's just out with a new book, Big Game, the NFL in Dangerous Times. Welcome to the News Hour. Good to be with you. So many people are going to know you as a political reporter. They'll remember your last book, This Town, which was all about Washington, D.C. Right. I'm just curious what it was like for you spending all these years chronicling and covering Washington and then now immersing yourself in what, to my eye, feels like a very different world. It, it, to my eye, it did, too. I wanted a respite from politics. I needed a break. And as it turned out, I jumped into the NFL swamp, and the respite from politics probably lasted about two minutes or so. <laughs> uh, there was no escape from politics in the NFL, and that includes league politics. I mean, getting sort of immersed with the owners and the commissioner and a bunch of players, you realize that, that the backbiting and the elbowing that goes on in Washington uh, is very comparable to what you see in this organization. But then, obviously, Donald Trump got involved, and the NFL has become this hobby horse of his, and he thinks it's a winning political issue for him, and he uh, sort of jumped on it. You actually uncovered a tape of owners talking about the difficulty about they were the, having in this. What, what did you find? This was during the height of the national anthem crisis last October. Uh, there was a private meeting between a group of players and a group of owners that Roger Goodell, the commissioner, convened at the Park Avenue headquarters. And uh, it was a private meeting, and uh, one of the participants in this was nice enough to share an audio recording of this with me and Ken Belson, my colleague at the New York Times. And to be able to listen to how the owners talk about this issue and really the, the kind of primal fear they have of Donald Trump was very reminiscent some, somewhat of listening to sort of U.S. senators or congressmen, practically Republicans, who are living in fear of the next presidential tweet. It's like you have a sense of someone who is kind of manipulating events from afar. And um, I was amazed at how scared they sounded, how confused they sounded, and also how short-sighted they sounded. I mean, they are sitting at the top of a multi-billion dollar empire. Uh, they can just print money. I mean, it's not going to go away anytime soon. And yet they're just worried about the next tweet. You also spend a lot of time in the book and personally with Tom Brady, the NFL's golden boy, marquee yeah. man. And you admit uh, heavily in the book that you are a diehard Patriots fan. I think you refer to it as the, the disease you contracted early on. Yeah. What was that like for you? Tom Brady is a very good guy. I was able to write a profile of him for the Times Magazine a few years ago. And um, look, I've interviewed presidents and all kinds of CEO celebrity types. I don't think I've ever been as nervous as when I right? sort of got to meet like, you know, the, I got to be a fanboy. It's a kind of pathetic <laughs> thing to admit, but it's sort of true. And yet in the book, you're, you're not... You don't go easy on him. I mean, you're tough on him. You do point out, especially with regards to this uh, holistic mind-body thing he's doing with his guru, yeah. trainer fellow. Look, I mean, this is an absurd world we're talking about. I and mean, these are worlds of incredible wealth and incredible ego, incredible accomplishment, incredible success, but also incredible insularity. And I think, you know, it's incumbent upon me to sort of tell what this anthropology is like and how it's different from what you and I are used to. The subtitle of the book, as we described, is The NFL in Dangerous Times. I mentioned a few of the things that might be icebergs in the water. <laughs> what do you see as the most dangerous things for the NFL? Well, I mean, I think I would say the two things. One are definitely health and safety and you know, concussions and like the realization that the NFL is just going to be unsafe at any speed. Players keep getting bigger, faster, stronger. And you can probably influence it around the margins with some rule changes or some equipment changes. But ultimately, that's not going to change in any big way except that the research is going to keep showing us that it's very dangerous. And the more dead players' brains become available, the more awareness is going to be, and people are going to make um, hopefully informed decisions about whether they want to be a part of this. The other thing I think is just the technological and cultural change around cord cutting and technology change, and also just the, the idea that people have so many more options in entertainment, and there's just no sense that football has the room to grow that they might think it is. On the issue of the concussions and the degenerative brain disease, uh, your book is is filled with examples of players and owners and people on the margin saying, I don't want to talk about concussions, I don't right. want to address that. But it really is potentially an existential threat. If the, if the talent pool dries up, if enough kids and parents say, yeah. I'm not doing that, I don't know how the game survives. Look, I mean, for like a viewer of this, I like to think I'm a thoughtful viewer of this, there's a lot of cognitive dissonance that goes into watching and loving football. I mean, I experience it. I'm sure a lot of other people who watch football experience it. Um, 
there's this commingling of just loving the sport, loving what's on TV, the great spectacle that football presents, a lot of the nostalgia that I grew up with watching football, with you know the adult realizations of what this sport is doing to people. Of course, we've also been seeing this recent controversy with the Nike ads and Colin Kaepernick and the ongoing protests by players against police violence and racial injustice. Yeah. Uh, President Trump, as you mentioned, has clearly believes that that the antagonism against those guys is a winning political issue for him. Yeah. What, what are the owners' reaction to that? I mean, a lot of them have personal history with Donald Trump. I mean, a lot of them gave money to his campaign. Uh, Donald Trump himself has been trying to get into the NFL over four decades, and they really wouldn't give him the time of day. So they're, this is driven in some ways by personal grievance. Um, most of them know him sort of in that rich guy circle, and they want nothing to do with him. Uh, and yet now they have to deal with him because he's sitting in the White House and he's decided to sort of heckle from the bully pulpit. I mean, I assume we'll be hearing a lot more from him as we get closer to the midterm elections. Your book also spends a good deal of time dissecting the career of, of NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell. Yeah. How much of the problems facing the NFL do you put at his feet? Could he have ameliorated any of these things you're talking about? I, I think he could make them a lot better than he has. I mean, I'll say that in the last 10 years, which sort of you know mimics his commissionership, the league has gone from one of the most unifying institutions in America to probably the most polarizing sports brand we have. And I asked him flat out last January, do you bear any responsibility for this? And he punted, um, good football metaphor there. He said, well, I think that's more to do with the political times we're living through than anything else. And it's probably true, but it's also, I mean, it's, it's not, I don't think it's a healthy thing for the league to have a commissioner that is despised as widely as he is by the fans of the NFL and by a lot of the players of the NFL. I mean, yes, he makes people a lot of money, but this is 32 really rich guys, and uh, I think you know, the rest is sort of a drain on the brand in some ways. The book is Big Game, The NFL in Dangerous Times. Mark Leibovich, thank you. Thanks for having me. As students across the country return to their classrooms, how can they best prepare for the academic year ahead? Daniel Levitin is a musician, author, neuroscientist, and teacher. Every September, he tells his students something they would never expect, revealed in tonight's In My Humble Opinion. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. You may be familiar with this Mark Twain quote. It was used in the film The Big Short and in Al Gore's film An Inconvenient Truth. Twain is saying that if you're sure you know something, you act on it with the strength of conviction, never considering that you might be wrong. If you're sure that this alternative treatment will help cure you better than Western medicine, you'll forego the traditional treatment. Two-thirds of cancer patients think this way, that alternative medicine will prolong their lives. But in fact, patients who turn to it are twice as likely to die of their cancers, and they die earlier. If you're sure that your choice of political candidate is right, you're not going to be open-minded about any new evidence that might come in that could or should cause you to change your mind. I'm a college professor, and I train PhD students for careers as neuroscientists. They come into my laboratory full of confidence. They've been at the top of every class they've been in their entire lives. I spend most of my time trying to teach them that they don't know everything they think they do. My job as a teacher really is to unteach them. I'm always asking, why do you think that? What's the evidence? These lessons can take four to eight years. Knowledge can only be created in an environment where we're open to the possibility that we're wrong. You may recognize the Zen connection, the wisdom of insecurity. If you think you know everything, you can't learn anything. I think that all of us are capable of this kind of critical thinking. Every four-year-old asks a series of incessant why questions. We have this beaten out of us early on by worn down parents and teachers, but this why mode is the key to critical thinking. Think like a four-year-old. Ask why and how. Ask them often. This attitude allows us to navigate the world more effectively. Choosing among options or political candidates or medical treatments that are more likely to maximize our success and our well-being. By the way, Mark Twain is widely cited for the quote we began with, but there's no evidence that he ever said it or anything like it. The source of it is unknown. Sometimes you don't know what you think you do. A great lesson for all of us. 
And that's the news hour for tonight. I'm Judy Woodruff. Join us online and again here tomorrow evening for all of us at the PBS News Hour. Thank you, and we'll see you soon. You're watching PBS.